Hello again, everybody. Last time I covered how God has imparted, credited, accounted, imputed His perfect holy righteousness to those who believe in Him and in Christ Jesus. And it's a very hard concept for a lot of people to accept. God has just given me as a free gift, as Romans 5, 17 clearly calls it a gift. Is that really true? Yes, it is true. I need you to be sure that you've watched part one before you go into this one. This one and last one are probably some of the most important sermons I've ever given or will give. So I hope you will look into them. God wants us to understand that for the kingdom of God, every single person who will be in it will be perfectly righteous, his own righteousness. And God is not going to accept the best you can do. God is not. Because the best you can do, Paul said his righteousness by the law, his, his, uh, according to the law, was blameless in Philippians 3, I think around verse 6 or so. But then later on in Philippians 3 verse 9, he said, all, the only righteousness that I want is God's own righteousness by faith. God cannot sin. God cannot lie. God cannot ever stumble or fall. And so when he covers us with his righteousness, and uh, then that's what he sees and Jesus, besides God the Father, Jesus is the only being who has been able to replicate that righteousness and to have that same righteousness. And so we have faith in Jesus, and uh, we covered that last time. This time I'm going to go into far more detail. I am Philip Shields, founder and minister of Light on the Rock, and uh, thank you for coming. Remember that uh, we also have many hundreds and hundreds of sermons, video sermons, audio sermons, and hundreds and hundreds of blogs that are short articles as well. Use the search bar, put a word or two in there, and look for topics you're interested in. With Passover coming up in a couple months, a few months, uh, <clears throat> lots and lots of sermons about Passover. Scripture says in the Old and New Testament that the righteousness God is looking for, the goodness, the moral character that he's looking for is his own. Uh, it starts with Noah. They found favor with God. I like the word favor more than grace because everybody thinks of grace as unmerited pardon. And yet we know that Jesus Christ, it says in Luke, uh, grew in grace and favor with man and God. Uh, he did not grow in pardon. He grew in favor. And so uh, I like the word favor. And uh, now for some of us, maybe God's favor is unmerited. But I just like to know it's favor. And so God gives us a free gift, and he imputed it. Okay, Noah uh, became an heir of the righteousness by faith, Hebrews 11, 7, I think it is. And then Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, uh, believed God when God said when he was 85 that I will give you a son. Your, your remnant will be like the stars of heaven in, in, in multitude. He believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that verse is used all the way through uh, Romans especially, and Galatians, and other places in the New Testament. So um, Romans 4, verses 23 to 25, gives us the good news that it wasn't accounted just to him, but for all of us who believe, God is impartial. Anyway, in the Old Testament, Jerusalem is called the, uh, the city is called the Lord our righteousness. Isaiah 61, 10 uh, is, is God clothing us with his garments of righteousness. And uh, David spoke of wanting God's righteousness. I say all this because sometimes people say, if God's imputed righteousness was meant to be, it would be all through the Bible. It is. It absolutely is. Here's one, Psalm 72, verse 1. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. Psalm 72, verse 1. Isaiah 61, 10. He's clothed me with the garments of salvation and covered me with the robe of righteousness. There are a couple other New Testament scriptures that I wish I had used. I didn't have time to last time. Let's read them right now. Romans 9. This is just getting into this sermon. Romans 9, verses 30 to 32. Romans 9, verses 30 to 32. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness. Even the righteousness of faith, like Noah did, Hebrews 11, 7, became the heir of the righteousness by faith, not by works, but by faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? 
because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by works, by what they did with the law. Paul continued, now does that mean we don't keep the law? Does, does that mean we throw away the law? No. Romans 6 verse 1, no, we don't throw it away. The law tells us what sin is. It can't make us perfect. It cannot. So um, according to the new covenant, we need God's righteousness. Romans 10 verse 3, he continues, for they, the Jews, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God, and that is through faith in Christ. So like a rabbi I spoke to one time, a friend of mine, uh, I said, how do you guys see judgment and all of that? And he says, well, it boils down to this, Philip. He said, when God weighs my good deeds against my bad deeds, if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, I'm okay. I'll be in heaven, he says, you know, I'll, I'll be fine. But uh, that's just not what the Bible teaches. We have to have faith in God and his righteousness through Christ. And I'll explain that far more today. That sounds fanciful to a lot of people hearing that. They want to know they themselves did some things that made them righteous in God's eyes. That's why I spent the time last time in part one showing that it's not by our actions so much, but by faith, and then because our actions will always fall short. And because they fall short, we will always feel uh, unqualified. We will always feel on edge. Are we going to be in God's kingdom? Because I keep sinning from time to time. I keep falling short. I lose my temper. I lose my patience. I'm unkind. Or I gave somebody a finger. I never do that. Why did I do that? But I did that. So that's the point that Paul was saying. That, that which I hate, I, I still sometimes do. Romans 7. We all know, <clears throat> you've got to know, that our salvation is entirely God's. He is the one who selects us. He selects the bride for Christ. Christ has to accept them, accept us, and start to work with us to bring us then to know the Father better. better. Anyway, um, so anyway, he, he, he calls us and he leads us to repentance, Re, uh, Romans 2.5. God's goodness led you to repentance. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing. And then the blood of Jesus Christ in 1 John 1, 7 through 9, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. I want you to hear this, past, present, and future. All sin. Because there's still some ministers out there who take the verse in Romans that says the sins that were previously committed. Well, if you look at that in context, he's saying God was lenient with the sins previously connected until Christ came. Okay, he now, he now forgives us of all sin. All sin. 1 John 1. We'll read that in a second. So um, all means all, okay? And then when we do sin, 1 John 2 says we have an advocate. So John said, please don't sin, but if you do. So that explains that we who have accepted the righteousness of God will still sin, all right? When we believe in Jesus, the resurrected... Let's read that, Romans 2. When we believe in him as the resurrected Son of God, look what it says. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You really know that. You will be saved when you do that. For with the heart, one believes to righteousness. There it is. With the heart, one believes to righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. And then what happens when we confess? 2 Corinthians 5.21 happens. A verse you really should know. For 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's right after 2 Corinthians 5.17 that talks about us being a new creation. A new creation is something that's never been before. God creates you as a new creation. That's the new spirit-led uh, part of you. We still have the old flesh heart inside of us as well. We now have two hearts. These war against each other, Galatians 5 says. But anyway, so what happens in 2 Corinthians 5.21? If you, can, if you think of sin as money or righteousness as money, we have a big debt. We've all sinned horribly. So when God looks at our account, 
we owe a billion dollars, using the analogy, okay? God takes that billion dollars, pays it off through Christ. So we're no longer in debt to sin. But now we have a problem because we need money. We need money to buy gas and food and pay the mortgage and so on. So he not only pays the debt, he then puts into our account God's righteousness. So now when we look at our account, there's no more debt, but we have a billion dollars in there that we didn't work for, but was just given to us. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 really is saying. Let's read it. For he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, not a sin offering, to be sin itself for us. Because what did Jesus do? He took upon his own body all the sins of all the world, all the wrath that those sins caused, all the condemnation and shame that those sins caused. He took upon himself all of that. And when you put all that much sin on one being, yes, that he becomes sin. He is sin at that point. He who knew no sin to be sin for us. Those who are those translations that say sin offering, the word offering is not there in the Greek. Okay, please understand that. <clears throat> That's why I like to use New King James or King James, but I like the New King James because they use the same, King James and New King James use the same Greek old text, but the New King James puts it in more modern English. Okay, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God, righteousness of God in him. I want you to get the, the, that phrase, in him, in Christ, in God, in him. We are now part of him. We are now part of his body. All right? As part of his body, whatever he is now applies to us by faith in him. That's what people find so hard to accept. So I trust you watch part one to get the, all, all of that. And I, I've added a little bit here, Romans 9, Romans 10, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Now, you have God's righteousness imputed to you by faith. What happens when you sin now, when I sin, and you do sin, and I still sin, all of us do. Though we have God's Holy Spirit, we still, even with God's Spirit, as Paul did in Romans 7, we still fall short of the glory of God. So what happens? Does every sin we commit from now on cut us off again from God? Does he take back the gifts of his perfect righteousness? Does he call out and take back the gift of salvation? The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus? Does he take all that back when I uh, gave a white lie? It's still a sin. Or if I lost my temper? Or if I lusted? Does he take all that back? Well, we have to understand this thing. Romans 4 verse 5 says that God's righteousness, Romans 4 verse 5, is also given to the ungodly. Not just the godly. But to him who does not work, but believes on him. Romans 4 5. Who believes on him, who declares us righteous, who, who justifies the ungodly, the wicked, the sinners, including you and me including the very worst sinners. Some of you are in jail who are hearing this. You tell me so. No matter what you've done, no matter what consequences you're paying, if you believe in God's imputed righteousness and if you have repented and have accepted Jesus as your Savior, even you get to be justified, who justifies the ungodly, Romans 4 verse 5. That should make you very happy. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Romans 4, 5. So please understand that. It comes down to living by faith in Christ. And then we come to 1 John 1 and 1 John 2, the end of the Bible. 1 John 1, especially in verse 7 and 9, it talks about how all of our sins are cleansed. Are, he is cleansing. He cleanses present ongoing tense, not past tense. All of our sins, let's read it. 
I'll start in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses, present, ongoing, cleanses us from all sin. Those you committed intentionally, which is most of our sins, frankly, and those we committed without giving much thought to it. We had no idea we were doing something wrong. Ignorance, sins of ignorance, and sins of intention. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, if you read the first few chapters of Leviticus, the sacrifices were for sins of ignorance. Sin, sins that were done intentionally, God was very severe on. He still is, but even those sins, all sins means all. God is cleansing us from all sin. In verse 6 it says, We say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie. We must not, with God's righteousness now, with the Holy Spirit now, we must not just lightly continue to walk in darkness. We don't go places that are not suitable for a Christian. We don't watch things that are not suitable. A lot of you, a lot of us, have to make changes on what we watch, where we go, what we, what we hang out, where we hang out, and so on. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can't say we have no sin, that'd be a lie. And then from now on, we seek righteousness, but we still sin. So what happens? In the New Covenant, are we cut off? We know that uh, uh, it says in the Old Covenant that your sins have separated you from me. I know that verse, Isaiah 59, verse 2. But is that the way it is in the New Covenant? Okay, 1 John 1 has just said, when we sin, God cleanses us. It's, it's not past tense. He cleanses from all our past sins. No, he says, when we sin, God cleanses us. Now, chapter 2, verse 1 in the NIV, all my other, if I don't say I'm reading from this or that translation, I'm reading from New King James. 1 John 2, verse 1, My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. Please don't sin. But if anybody does sin, because John knew that he still sinned, Paul still sinned, we all still sin from time to time. That should be coming less and less. It should be... Uh, less and less serious sins as well. <clears throat> if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. We have an advocate, a defense attorney. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the whole world. And so when we sin, Jesus steps up to the plate and he says to God the Father, what she did was horrible. Those thoughts of adultery, finally giving in to it, or the wrath and the drunkenness and all these things that he is doing and so on. I paid that penalty. He doesn't have to pay it. I paid that penalty. I forgave him. And I, we gave him our righteousness because he had faith in me. He's still weak. I'm working with him on that. But he is not to be condemned. Remember Romans 8, 1? Therefore, there is now no condemnation if you're in Christ. No condemnation. So that's what Jesus does. Satan, get out of here. I paid all his, uh, con not, not I paid all his uh, penalties. So get out. You have no right to accuse him. Does that sound like he throws us away? Of course, we have to repent each time we sin. Please don't misunderstand me. Of course, and repent deeply when we sin. Every day, frankly. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Is our daily prayer. So he comes to our defense. We're precious in his eyes. He wants to find us and spare us like the lost sheep. In Luke 15, when the Pharisees, the Orthodox Jews of their day, when they saw Jesus hanging out and having lunch with people they considered sinners, tax collectors, and so on. They couldn't believe it. How could a righteous man even eat with them? Okay? It's horrible. And he saw that. In, uh, I'm in Luke 15, verse 2, 3. And so he spoke this parable to you, to them. If, how many of you, if you have a hundred sheep and one goes missing, we'll just leave it out there. 
Or do you not leave the 99 with someone else in the wilderness and you go look for that one and when you find him, verse 5, you lay it on your shoulders rejoicing and not only that, but you call all your neighbors and, and say, wow, come on, I found my sheep. Let's rejoice. Let's have a nice meal and celebrate. Verse 7, I say to you likewise, Luke 15, 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. That uh, Repenting is turning around, going the other way, changing your mind about what you want to be and what you want to be doing. It's, it's, it's telling God you're sorry, yes, of course, but it's also turning around and being like the prodigal son who came home, okay? We come home to God. So God leaves the 99 and comes after you when you've gone astray. I don't care how badly you've gone astray. He comes after you because you are precious in his eyes, even when you've gone astray, even when you've sinned, maybe especially when you've gone astray. He wants to remind you, I'm not letting you leave me and the flock, my flock, like this. There's a lot of joy in heaven when he finds you and brings you back. I know about Isaiah 59 too, that your sins have cut you off from God, but I'm teaching what the Son of Man specifically says in the New Covenant. Please accept it. Some of you ministers and members are overplaying Isaiah 59 too, that your sins have cut you off from me, so I can't hear you, I can't help you. Please read the gentleness of God on your own. Isaiah 40 verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 63 verse 9 and Isaiah 46, verses 3 and 4. One of those talks about how even when you're old and gray-haired, you're still mine and I'll still have you with me. You're still precious to me. That's also Old Testament. Why don't we read those more? No, we like to holler in the microphone and say, your sins, your sins, your sins have cut you off from God. Let's quit overplaying that verse. Look at all the context of it, too, because also in Isaiah, besides the ones I just gave you, Isaiah chapter 1, though your sins be as scarlet, when you come back to me, I will make them white as snow. I'll make them white as wool. Come back, Israel. Come back. The end of Isaiah 1, verses 16 to 18. John 10 tells us that, in fact, once we belong to God, we're part of his flock, and now we're part of his church. We're part of his family. Once we belong to God, no one will snatch you out of his hand. John 10, 26 to 30, But you don't believe because you're not of my sheep, but my sheep hear my voice. Brethren, we've got to turn things off. Spend less time on TV, Snapchat, whatever they're called. I don't even know, Facebook, Twitter. Start finding time to seek God in his word, hear his voice. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. The sheep I have now are never going to perish. Because as far as I'm concerned, I've already given them that eternal life, as you'll see in a minute. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. <clears throat> My Father, who's given them to me, is greater than all. This whole teaching in the Trinity that there's three equal beings, equal, co-equal. No, no, no. God the Father is above all, greater than all, is supreme. He's called God Most High. Jesus, the Word, does the words of the Father. He does the deeds the Father asks him to do. Completely, perfectly. He is in second in command. He's not number one. Number one is God the Father. Number two is Jesus the, the Messiah, the, the, the anointed one. I and my Father are one. So they, they act as one, but you can't tell a difference. What one says is exactly what the other says, and so forth, and what they do. That's God's Son talking to you. No one's going to be able to snatch you out of my hand or the Father's hand. I hope you uh, seek his voice. Tune in to him like the old-fashioned radios in the old days. This is the God I serve. He doesn't want anyone taking you away from him. The God I serve. And as you understand this sermon, 
and God's receiving God's imputed righteousness. I'd like to ask you all, if you haven't already, in prayer, not only receive Jesus as your Savior, but receive the last part of 2 Corinthians 5.21, and he became sin for us, and he became the righteousness of God in Christ. Pray, Father in heaven, Jesus, my Lord, please come into my life. Take over my life. Reign in me. Be my Lord. Be my King. Help me to submit to you, to follow you, to seek you. And when you do that, you will start to understand God in a much deeper way than you ever have in your life. The God I know laughs. It says in, uh, where is that? I think it's, I don't have it in my notes here. I can't believe that. I think it's Psalms 16, verse 11, that in your presence is the fullness of joy and pleasures, pleasures forevermore. God is fun. My God is fun. He's often glad and happy, even over you. Do you see that? Do you see God that way? My God also cries. My God feels. My God also weeps. Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the Bible, John 11. I think it's verse 35. At Lazarus' resurrection, before he was resurrected, he saw the sadness. Jesus wept. When he came to Jerusalem, he looked down from Mount of Olives, and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathers its chicks and puts it under its wing. But you would not. And it says, he wept. We know he cried out with vehement cries and tears in Gethsemane. Jesus is also God. The Word was God. Is God. So my God laughs, has pleasure forevermore. My God weeps. My God listens when you pray and I pray, when we want to talk to him. He's not of the mentality children are to be seen and not heard. No, no, he wants to hear from you. My God hears my repentance. Often he does. My God assures me of his love. I mean, there's so many verses that God assures us of his love. John 15, 9 and 12, love one another as I have loved you. John 13, 34, you shall have love for one another as I have loved you. Romans 8, 37, we're now more than conquerors. Through him who loved us, Romans 8, 37, God speaks his love. Many, many, many billions of people are growing up without a dad or mom, especially without a dad who says, I love you and hugs you. That's not our Father in heaven. I had to forgive my father, my earthly father, for some things. And I said to God many, many times, Please be my father. Please love me as a father loves. Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 17. Read that on your own. This says, look at this. Jehovah, your God, in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you in gladness. He will quiet you with his love. It's like a loving father, loving mother will take a baby that's crying and upset or a worried child, and just bring him close. He'll quiet you with his love. It's okay, son. It's okay, daughter. I'm here. I've got you. He will rejoice over you with singing. Do any of you think of God that way? Singing to you? That's my God. Come to know him. God assures me that nothing will separate me from his love. In Romans 8, the, the end of it, Romans 8, 31 to 39, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing, and nothing, and nothing, and nobody. You ministers who preach that in the new covenant when we sin, we're cut off from God, don't seem to know Romans 8, 31 to 39. Please go back and read it. And the righteousness that I produce now in my life is not my own efforts, but Philippians 1.11 says, 
we produce the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. We'll look at that again later. Everything I've just said applies to you even when you sin. It applies to me too. Nothing takes us out of his hand. We're there forever and ever, unless we ourselves, which will be the next sermon, what can happen that can cause us to lose all of this? It's just one person. It's not Satan. It's not God. It's you. We'll talk about that. So don't let you do that. The gift of God's salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, the gift of his righteousness. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. If I give you something, I say it's a gift, and then I come back a couple days later and say, I've changed my mind. I don't think you're worthy of that gift. I want it back. You don't give gifts and take them back. The gift and calling of God are irrevocable. Let that sink in. Let's get it right. Now, what about the kingdom of God? Many of you are worried that you're not going to qualify for the kingdom of God. We're now part of his body. It's the kingdom of his son. You know, it's the kingdom of God. Jesus said, my father has bequeathed to me a kingdom and I'm going to bequeath to you places in that kingdom. You shall all, he says to the disciples, you shall all be ruling over the 12 tribes. <clears throat> Colossians 1, verse 11 to 14, strengthened with all might. Are you already? These verses, I want you to notice the tenses. Are they past tense or present tense? We're now part of Christ. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Colossians 1 12. If you're reading out of the King James, you'll miss it because the King James has Old English here. That, uh, what does King James says? Who has made us meet partakers of his righteousness. What does that mean? Okay, so this is out of the New King James, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Meet partakers who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. You are, if you're in Christ, already qualified for the kingdom. What you'll be doing in the kingdom will depend on your works because you're rewarded by your works, but you're saved, being in the kingdom, saved by grace, not by works. You're already qualified because you're in Christ who is there. He, verse 13, has delivered, past tense, qualified, past tense. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. We still sometimes go to the power of darkness and give in. But as far as God's concerned, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed, King James translated us. What does that mean? It means conveyed, moved us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. God who sees the end from the beginning. That's Isaiah 46, 10, one of my favorite verses lately. God sees the end from the beginning. Sees us as already being in his kingdom. He's already qualified us. Colossians 1, 12. Colossians 1, 13. He's, co he's conveyed us into that kingdom. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? It's the same thing in Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. All the past tenses there. He called us, qualified us, predestined us. It's all there. Romans 8, 29 to 30. So the way we are viewed is in Christ, part of him who is perfect, who never sinned. I'm part of him now. Do you accept that? A lot of you are struggling to accept that. We're part of his body. So we have to let Christ live in us. We have to get out of the way and follow him. Follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in us. Follow the way he walked on earth, righteously, obediently. So I'm not teaching that you can do whatever you want once you receive the righteousness of God. You can do whatever you want and be whatever you want. You can go back to darkness. You can go back to sin. No, no, no. I am not teaching that. We must follow him. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4, says it's no longer us who live, but Christ. If you then raise with Christ, seek those things which are above, which where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Colossians 3, 
Verse 3 now. For you, the old you, died. Your life, your new life now, the new creation, is hidden with Christ, who is also in God, God the Father. Hidden in Christ, in God. You guys read this, you read right over it. This is earth-shaking, this is an earth-shaking statement. When Christ, who is our life, appears. Do you believe that? This is the imputed righteousness. When Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Paul goes on to say in Colossians 3, verse 5, all the way to the end, Quit doing the old stuff. Put to death the deeds of the body, the deeds of the flesh. So that's what I teach too. You can't go on sinning as a way of life as opposed to sinning as a slip up here and there because of our fleshly nature that we still have. We have the new creation. We still have the fleshly nature. In Galatians 5 at the end of it says these two are fighting each other all the time. Let's let the spirit one win by giving attention to it. But because you guys have a hard time, many of you guys have a hard time accepting what I'm saying, you live in a life of depression because you know you just aren't making it. You know you're failing. Keep slipping up. And I know that about me. But it doesn't matter because my life is hidden in Christ, in God, which we just read. Now, Ephesians 2, verse 8, by grace, by favor, you have been saved. Past tense. You have been saved. If I was to ask all of you hearing this, are you saved? Every single one of you who has God's Spirit, who have God's Spirit, every one of you who has God's Spirit should say, of course, for by grace you have been saved. Through faith, through faith, through faith. It's faith from the beginning all the way to the end. And that not of yourselves, but of God. It's a gift of God, not of works. For you are his workmanship. Remember that verse. Whatever's working in us is God working, not us working. God working in us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so on. And God created beforehand that we should walk in those good works. Other scriptures I'll put up on the board right now, you can write them down, that also say we have already been saved. If you ask me, are you saved, Philip? I will say yes. If you ask me, do you have the righteousness of God? I would say yes. It's been imputed to me. Do I always live it perfectly? No. But I have it. God's given it to me. And the gifts of God are irrevocable, Romans eleven twenty nine. These are verses you guys, many of you guys aren't hearing probably. But uh, it's there in Scripture. Have been saved. Now, the Bible also says, and I'll put these up now too, there are many Scriptures that say we are being saved. And there are some Scriptures that talk about how we shall be saved if we endure to the end and if we seek God with all our heart and... and uh, are there, faithful at the end. Revelation 17, 14, those who are with Christ when he returns are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. So are, if you're still wondering if you've made it, you're still looking at yourself. Huge sin. Stop it. Have faith instead in Jesus Christ in you. By faith, have faith in him. He has no sin. Never will. And his righteousness has been imputed. God's very own righteousness has been credited to you because you believe. David had done a horrible bunch of series of sins in his life. And then when he, the biggest sin was not, what well, might have been, the one of Uriah the Hittite, because that one was a sin of intention. That was a sin uh, premeditated. Bathsheba was a sin of being tempted. In his weakness, he gave in. 
and then premeditatedly he sought to kill her husband and did kill him with lies and everything. In the summary of it all, there's a verse that says uh, David did everything perfectly or man after God's own heart except in the matter of Uriah. Not the matter of Bathsheba, that was weakness. The matter of Uriah. Naming, counting Israel, 70,000 died. He was tempted and gave in to it. I don't know that he premeditatedly did that, but the worst thing God says was Uriah. Psalm 51, verses 7 to 14 is part of David's prayer. I want you to read through it. We, we've had it posted here on the board for a while. And he's saying in verse 8, Make me hear the joy and gladness, and help my bones rejoice. Verse 10, Create in me. You're the creator of a, of a pure heart, God. Create in me a clean heart. Renew your steadfast spirit within me. Please don't cast me from your presence. Verse 11, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore to me, because I've lost it. I need it. The joy of your salvation. So in the one prayer of deep repentance, he goes from tears of sorrow to tears of joy. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Do you have the joy of salvation? Do you know you're going to be in the kingdom? Do you know you're righteous in God's eyes? Do you know your sins have all been forgiven, each one, each day? Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And forgive me my debts as I forgive those who sin against me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Verse 12, uphold me by your generous spirit, and then I will teach the transgressors your way. Sinners will be converted to you. And the end of verse 14 uh, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the, uh, the guilt of bloodshed, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Does David know about God's righteousness? Yes, right there. Another one, besides Psalm 72, 1. My tongue will sing of your righteousness, yours. <clears throat> what robs us of the joy of salvation is not believing this not having the faith to believe in Christ, that he is my life, that he is whom God looks at. It'll rob you of your joy if you don't believe, not if you don't realize that God will not cut you off when you sin now that you're part of his family. Do any of you cut off your children when they foul up? Are they no longer your child? Do you no longer love them? If you can do that, how much more can God? You won't have joy of salvation if you don't realize you've already qualified. Colossians 1.12, you've already been conveyed into the kingdom. As far as I'm concerned, I, myself, am living for, for and in God's kingdom. Colossians 1.13 and many others I could show you. We are now part of him. We're part of his body. I know the kingdom is still coming. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. The kingdom of God, by the way, is already existent up there in heaven. It's already here. It's been here forever and ever. In the universe, Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one offering, he, Christ, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I have a sermon on God's perfection for us, which kind of parallels this one different focus. It's on perfection. I recommend you watch that. Now, one more thing. If you ask me, if I, let me ask you, do you have, right now, do you have everlasting life? Do you have eternal life? If you really understood the scriptures, there'd be no hesitation in saying absolutely yes. Yet there's a sermon out there we've heard recently. You do not have eternal life. Well, I beg to differ. And I stand on the authority of the very words of the Son of God. So let's read them. Yeshua is saying all this. John 6, 47. Most assuredly I say to you, if you believe in me, he who believes in me has. The Greek says has. They're all has. 
believes in me has everlasting life. John 5, 24, 25. Surely I say to you, he who hears my word believes in, me, in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. Now, remember that phrase, shall not come into judgment, has already passed from death into life. John 3, 35, 36, the Father loves the Son, has given all things into his hand. He who believes, this is John speaking here, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Now let me ask you again, do you have, do you believe in the Son? Do you have everlasting life? Answers to both, I hope, are yes, unless you don't believe in the Son. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you believe in Christ and have made him your Lord and Savior, you have everlasting life. First John 5, the, you, any minister who says we don't have eternal life, repent of that. It's not true. 1 John 5, 11 to 13, this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son, has given us eternal life. Verse 12, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you, they believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe. So don't just believe in the past, but continue to believe in the Son of God. Now that we receive the gift of his eternal life, yeah, I know I can be hit by a truck and I could die, but that's not real death. That's not eternal death. I have eternal life because Isaiah 46.10 says, God who sees the end from the beginning knows that he's given that to me. Even, yes, hear me, even with my sins that I commit from time to time. For I pray you sin not, 1 John 2, 1, but when you sin, if you sin, you have an advocate with God the Father, Jesus the righteous. Jesus the righteous one. Romans 10, 29, his gifts are not revocable, so we seize it. Like it says in 1 Timothy 6, 12, these are all being posted on the board behind me. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. If we can't go back to darkness as a way of life, please hear me. I am not saying that you can do what you want. We're being told, fight the good fight of faith. Ephesians 5 says, put on the whole armor of God. Fight, fight sin. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. Don't just shadow box like a boxing in the air, but fight with intensity, Paul says in other place. <clears throat> Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Grab it. Hang on to it. Seize it. Make it yours. Lay hold to which you were also called. You're called to eternal life. And have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, Timothy. Now, God gives us his righteousness. But how is it duplicated in us? How does it work in our daily lives? I can't go back and just do anything you want. Philippians 1.11 Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. Fruits of righteousness which are by all my hard work to be right. No, that's not what it says. Which are by Jesus Christ. Remember, God imputes his righteousness to us through Christ. Faith in that. 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 26, it talks about how not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Verse 29 to 31, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ. i got to do that sermon, the update on it. I have a sermon already on what it means to be in God, in Christ. But let's update it as a video of him who are in Christ, who Christ, who became for us, became for us wisdom from God 
and righteousness and sanctification, holiness and redemption became for us righteousness. Romans 8 verses 2 to 4. I doubt very much that many of you have had this preached in your church service, especially if you're a conservative believer who keeps the seventh day Sabbath, uh, Hebrew roots folks, other folks. I wonder if this has been preached strongly in your church. I didn't until the last decade or so. But Romans 8, verses 2 to 4, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do because it was weak. Because of my weak flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Do you believe that? Anyway, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. Again, when we accept the righteousness of God, we are committing that that way of life has changed. I will still slip up, Father, but and I know I will, but that's not my life anymore. My life is Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh. What's the flesh? Well, go to the Galatians 5, verses 19 to 26. You, you see about the, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, contrasted. And the works of the flesh are adultery and fornication and drunkenness and and revelries and, and outbursts of anger and wrath and so forth. We don't walk that way anymore. If we know that we have a hot temper, we're working on it. We're fixing it by Christ. That the righteous requirement of the law, when God looks at me, he sees Jesus Christ. He looks at me, he looks at you, and he says the righteous requirement of the law is done. It's fulfilled in her, even though she still slips up. Because again, Romans 7, Paul says, I still do the things I hate, but it's no longer I who does them, but sin that dwells in me, the old flesh, is doing it. But that old flesh should have died. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank Christ. I thank God through Christ, my Lord. Romans 8, 1, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That last part of the verse is gone in all the newer translations. But either way, we are not condemned anymore when we're in Christ. Remember Philippians 3, 9. In Philippians 3, Paul said uh, that his own, uh, concerning the law, blameless. I think that's Philippians 3, 6 or so. And then verse 9, he says, I don't want my own righteousness, which is from the law. I don't want it. I want my righteousness to be that of faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Many of you think might be being blocked from seeing all of this because there's this one verse that's nagging at you. And let's get that sorted out. Philippians 2.12. In the same book where Paul says, keep that in mind, I don't want my own righteousness from the law. There is a verse in Philippians 2.12 that tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Wow, does that mean I'm my own savior then? If I'm working out my salvation, then I'm my own savior. Read the next verse. Work out your own salvation for it is God who works in you, both to want to do, that's will to do, and to do according to his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling by beseeching God to work in me. Let me submit to you working in me. That's what it's saying. You guys who keep using members and ministers alike, Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation of fear and trembling. Read the next verse. Get it right. It's not by our works. We're saved by grace, by favor, not by works, lest any man should boast. Learn that. Get rid of using Philippians 2.12 to justify your own efforts. Our effort is to follow Christ. Our effort is to stay attached to him like the vine that he is. 
Our effort is to stay with him, seek him, walk with him. In John 15, that's what, John, that's what Jesus says. Yeshua means salvation, means Savior. All through, that's why I love the name Yeshua. Because when you really understand it, as you read verse after verse in Isaiah and many other places where it says, He has become my salvation. He has become my Yeshua. Okay, He is my salvation. I love it. Acts 15, verse 4, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Philippians 2, 12, work out your own salvation. You can't do it unless you apply verse 13, for it's God who works in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide. You stay attached. You live in me. In me. Here again is the in part. I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. You want to bear much fruit? Abide in Christ. Make that your goal. Make that your desire every morning. Make sure you're praying when you get up, praying when you go to bed, praying many times throughout the day, seeking him, abiding in him, and you will start to change. I know it seems like it takes forever, but you will and I will. If you don't abide in him, you're, you're cast out as a branch. If you've been broken off already, you're on the ground, be picked up to be your branch separated from the vine, you're going to burn up in fire. I don't want that. But remember John 15, 4 and 5, you can do nothing. Nothing apart from me. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Verse 4. Unless you abide in me, in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So we're at this point now where we have to be, like Paul says in Acts 17, 28, in God we live and move and have our being. And we overcome with Christ, who has overcome already. I'm going to give a sermon soon on overcoming. I have to. Next time we'll continue, but in a, it won't be part of this series, but I want to specifically address there's so many verses that talk about how we have been saved. We can't be snatched out of God's hand. We have eternal life. So there's this doctrine of eternal security that you can't ever possibly lose it. Once saved, always saved, no matter what. And I'm going to show that that is a terrible misunderstanding. And we'll go into 2 Peter 2 and Jude and Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 and other places that show that we, in fact, can decide, knowing full well what we're doing, to leave God. But that'll be for next time. Okay? Eternal security will be the title, I think. We'll see what, if that's what God wants. So this thing of God's imputed righteousness, He's given us the gift of eternal life. He's given us the gift of forgiveness. He's given us the gift of His righteousness, Romans 5, 17. And he's imputed the same righteousness to us that he did to Abraham, Romans 4, verses 23 to 25. Please accept that. And then part of that is to be begging God, please, Father in heaven, restore to me like you, like you did for David, the joy of your salvation. Let me sing of your righteousness. Come to really know the God most high in Jesus, as I explain, a God who weeps and laughs and has feelings and loves you. Who loves you? He says so so many times, states it. By staying attached to Yeshua, you have the fruits of his righteousness, Philippians 1, 11, John 15, 5, and 8. Realize that you have to stay attached. What a high and precious calling we have. Oh, please accept it. Go back to the joy of salvation. Father in heaven, we come to you. We just ask you now to please get the people who are hearing this and who will hear it, the joy of your salvation. Let them know that they're in your family, that we are part of your kingdom, that we are saved, that we have been saved by your favor, by your grace. Look down with blessings on us and shine upon us with a smile. Help us accept your love. Help us accept your gifts. Stop this thinking we have to do it ourselves. Help us follow Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference, 
for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.